Hello and good morning, at least in my time zone to everyone. I know it's good afternoon in the East Coast. My name is Katie Chapman and I want to get started here for the science of food addiction. Just a little bit of housekeeping for everyone. Um, you are muted um, upon entry and entering into this webinar. Thank you for joining. We will have a question and answer section towards the end of the presentation. However, if there's any questions that you may have, you can put it, um, you can ask those at the end or in your chat box area, Q&A area. So again, welcome and hello to the science of food addiction. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Katie Chapman. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist specializing in bariatrics nutrition and weight management for 10 plus years um, with some hands-on clinical experience with some of the leading medical providers. I am the 2010 Recognized Young Dietitian of the Year Award and the 2018 Excellence in Weight Management Practice Award winner, both through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And I spent the first decade of my career with as the lead dietitian for Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. And for the past several years, I've been working with industry partners and consumers to improve nutrition education within the field. And I also maintain a private practice um, here in Los Angeles, California. So welcome. Today's webinar is brought to us by HealthWise, a trusted partner in weight management solutions. And they bring together nutritional products, weight loss plans, and business support all in one space. They are committed to providing weight loss practitioners with the products, programs, and professional assistance they need to inspire clients to overcome obesity and reclaim their passion for life. Thanks so much to HealthWise for sponsoring and bringing us this fascinating topic today. I want to jump right in um, with our objectives of this webinar. We'll review the following. Um, food addiction and other food relationships, brain biochemistry and how food can affect those usual pathways, and then rounding out with some practical clinical applications to reduce the symptoms of food addiction, or even just to recognize um, how to get those symptoms much more in check. So let's dive right in. I know that in my practice, I come across people um, stating food addiction or that they have different relationships with food. And so I know that I wanted to do a deep dive into what all this means and how can I be a better practitioner if in, within this scope. So food addiction was actually proposed in 1956 by Randolph and it described a pattern of eating behaviors, excess consumption, and noted the similarities between these types of patterns surrounding food and addictive behaviors. And so what's important to keep in mind is that this is a myriad of mechanisms that surround food in the anticipation, the approaching, ingesting, and even after effects of reflecting about food. Um, most people feel driven to engage in these weight promoting eating behaviors such as binge eating or compulsive overeating when exposed to a certain addictive food substance. However, food addiction is kind of a controversial or um, phrase that comes with a little bit of um, concern. A lot of people note that food addiction is misleading and would rather describe the term 
as eating addiction or even addictive eating disorder. Um, noting that the behavioral addiction really reflects dependence on a behavior or a feeling brought about by an action as opposed to the substance itself. And we can see those along the same lines when we talk about a substance use addiction. So let's dive into looking at eating addiction on its own. This is a complex behavior that, as I said, it's not necessarily the food itself, but the individual's relationship with eating. And eating addiction stresses that behavior component. We do note that there are palatable food availability that kind of produce that light up in the brain and changes it um, and shows binge eat like eating and even withdrawal symptoms um, when not having those foods. And those compulsions are rather strong itself. Um, even with eating addiction, we can see that binge eating disorder or um, that disordered behavior with eating is also somehow related. So in diving in deeper with this terminology, we do have to note that binge eating disorder does, does kind of come up and come into the, the plan. So when questioning how does food or eating addiction fit into the overall schema of eating, um, the current view notes that eating addiction is a specific construct that is distinct but related to binge eating disorder. So what are we looking at in terms of binge eating then? Um, this is the DSM-5, the criteria for binge eating disorder. Um, we have kind of the criterion one through five of this and looking at binge eating is characterized as the eating at a discrete period of time with a sense of lack of control. Um, also episodes have very succinct three or more of the following in those criteria. Number two, there's definitely distress um, regarding that binge eating. And when binge eating occurs, it is has an average at least one day a week for three months um, and does not have any other compensatory behavior involved in it. What I do note, and just to kind of bridge the gap a little bit too, among weight, binge eating disorder, um, eating addiction, and let's say bariatric surgery is when looking at this binging behavior physically for someone with bariatric surgery um, or who had gone under bariatric surgery, they have a sense of that criterion one, that loss of control. And um, typically since they physically can't get in, been, um, since they physically can't get in a high amount of food, that lack or that loss of control is the feeling that is most present with a binge that occurs after bariatric surgery. And I'm sure in all of our practices, we might see clients or, or patients that have undergone um, bariatric surgery and are still working with um, these different behaviors and different constructs. So there's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful kind of criteria that was developed to really explore food addiction, its prevalence, and um, kind of related into uh, binge eating disorder and eating disorder patients. So it's called the Yale Food Addiction Scale. And so um, this was designed in college students and binge eaters. And then it was used actually in eating disorder patients and subjects with obesity. The Yale Food Addiction Sale is a systematic tool 
that is just utilized to distinguish between individuals with or without addictive like eating patterns. And this scale may be a useful tool to just detect addictive qualities around food. And they use a seven system criteria um, identified for su substance dependence. And I just put a little bit of the, the kind of pieces of it. It's definitely much more than seven questions. And even within the development, um, there's that seven symptom criteria that relates to individual questions. And it just shows a little bit of um, where that addiction like qualities can come into and potentially traits and traits that have been developed in relationship to food. And I'll kind of take a deep dive into that um, brain-like structure and also um, traits that we commonly see within whether we call it food addiction, eating addiction, or binge eating, um, or constructs within those um, areas. You'll note that during this talk, I will possibly pop back and forth between several of those monikers just because there is not one that currently makes it super clear in our um, development of looking at this potential addiction. So common symptoms of food addiction in adults um, from this Yale food addiction scale is the persistent desire or repeated failures to reduce the amount of food intake, continued consumption despite harmful consequences of food, and a lot of time spent in trying to reduce the amount of food consumed, as well as a lot of time spent on recovering from this overeating. And we might see that within our own clients as well. So Gerhardt, who developed this food addiction scale, went on to take a look in comparison of it within binge eating disorder. And I thought that overlap was actually um, really nice to see and to note that there are certain food addiction um, criteria that match binge eating criteria and those that actually don't match and that there's other aspects to potential food addiction or potentially um, different than binge eating that might need to be paid attention to or maybe just needed to take note to help your clients even further. So in food addiction, binge eating disorder, it, it comes back to our brain and how our brain biochemistry, how those food, how food can affect those usual pathways. And I wanna take a deep dive into the brain so we can just get a general understanding of how this works and how this looks like. So be warned, there are going to be some pictures of the brain. I'm going to try to not make it too sciencey, but hopefully we can geek out a little bit together for a second. So deep dive into this brain here. So we have a present understanding that body weight regulation encompasses several things. So there are long-term long -term signals, which is leptin and insulin that are activated in a proportion of adipose tissue stores. And there's a conjunction with the amount of energy consumed over an extended period of time. And then we also have our short-term signals, which is our ghrelin, glucose, GLP-1, et cetera, some of those other um, hormones that are present in digestion. And those are activated in proportion to volume and composition of nutrients ingested um, within our digestive tract. So we can see here quite a, several things are happening. And so the crosstalk between these distinct pathways influences 
are neural circuits involved in both short-term and long-term feedback signals that are implicated in the initiation of behavior, autonomic, and endocrine responses. This representation, though, kind of ends up being incomplete. And we have a two-tier system that guides our feeding behavior. The other one of this model consists of indirect pathways involved in the interpretation of external and external stimuli. So these pathways include, but are not limited to, our cortical limbic regions within the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the thalamus. And so if you look at that brain up there, it talks about our visual cues, our olfactory cues, emotion, social context, cognition. And so these brain areas and the body actually form a model for central processing of food intake and control of that food intake. So it's not only just digestion, nutrition, how our body feels, how our hormones within our digestive tract work, but also the brain jumps in here to look at that food availability, those cues, even emotion, which cannot be ignored as we process how people choose and um, work with their food intake. So with kind of if we change this and just make this super basic, we have some basic science here. So our behaviors have consequences and our unhealthy eating behaviors affect the brain. So that may light up our different neuro pathway systems. And I put some examples of those there. Um, but essentially, they change our neurotransmitters to say basically, hey, we have this certain eating behavior, maybe healthy, but it's super, super exciting. So if we continue on that kind of basic science, and I'm going to take note more of this dopamine system, which is kind of our, or what we call our reward pathway, our reward stimuli, our behaviors have consequences and our unhealthy eating behaviors affect the brain and hence they affect our dopamine function. So food restriction actually sensitizes our dopamine system and that makes it more elevated or more sensitive more heightened. Um, so that restriction makes someone think like, oh, wow, this is going to be super exciting. This is going to be super rewarding. And excessive food intake actually desensitizes the dopamine system. So that excessive food intake makes our brain think in ways as, okay, great, thanks, this is just our normal life. This is how much food we have, get to eat, um, and take in over time. When we bounce back to, between both of these, it has some really, really um, interesting signals that sensitizer really, really heightens and then really, really desensitizes. So that kind of drop that real high and that real, real well. So when we change in that eating surrounding those highs and those lows, um, we change that dopamine function. And so that kind of re reinforces the disordered eating behavior, food addiction, eating addiction, um, and tells our brain, hey, you know, we're, we're not going to have this because we have this real, you know, drop in our dopamine. But at that same time, because of that restriction, it heightens that 
anticipation or that reward within here. And so when the suggestion of this is that the conception of palatable food substances, and we'll talk about that next and what I mean by that, it stimulates the mechanism in the brain that requires now a greater degree of stimulation to experience that same exact degree of reward. So additional foods are needed to be eaten or the intensity, let's say, of the flavor to avoid food cravings and even those those withdrawal symptoms that drop in that dopamine function. So basically, a change in eating changes that functionality and then reinforces that need for more or that need for heightened symptoms. And so how the relationship of food addiction or the addiction model within this scope or within this context is that the, the wisdom that drugs of abuse um, act by hijacking the sites of the brain that mediate natural rewards, such as food, food's a natural reward. Um, and these sites are mediated by dopamine and that dopamine, dop- dopamine mechanism. So any demonstration that food or interest in food influences this activity um, is oftentimes taken to the next step of noting addiction. But really, we're just noting that this response in accordance to food is abnormal, is heightened, and is changed. So where do we see that most often and in what type of foods, right? Hyperpalatable foods. <laughs> so this terminology may have been heard um, before, but they basically contain certain combinations of sugar, salt, fat, and refined carbohydrates, which tap into the brain's reward system and make it harder to stop eating because of the greater response of the dopamine system. So just what we were talking about before, that heightened flavor, that intensity of taste is needed um, to get those same reward functions. And so restriction and kind of binge or that like addiction and stopping um, paradigm that results in promoting um, that addictive type behavior or that um, behavior or that response of continually needing these types of food. And it's important to just take a look at the impact on the regulation of mood and that some individuals may consume these types of nutrients to self-medicate from negative um, emotions or conditions such as anxiety, depression, or even mental fatigue. So several things going on there, more than even just the food. But the top hyperpalatable foods, chocolate, ice cream, french fries, pizza, cookie, cake, uh, popcorn, and cheeseburgers, um, have that certain combination that just tap into the brain a little bit further. So the, the main kind of, let's say, construct of, of what happens in this cycle is that there's a re- restriction, it heightens or gives that negative effect, and then there's that palatable food that is that reward, and then the obsessive, obsessiveness or the exceedance of consumption leads to a loss of control, and then that control ends up being a bit scary. And then there's that restriction again, and that cycle continues to happen. So what, why does that kind of continue, or what, what can we look at in this dopamine response in that situation? And I'd like to break this down as easy as possible. And let's say, for example, we get a random cupcake. And with that random cupcake from our nice friend, 
it heightens our dopamine response and extends it for a really nice period of time. We really enjoyed that cupcake and that awesome friend. And then let's say we get a cupcake every single Monday. So what happens over time is that every single Monday we get that cupcake and we have a dopamine response to it, but it's shortened. It's, it's like, woohoo, yay, thank you, thanks, nice friend. But it doesn't extend as long as it very um, first did. And let's say then we stop getting a cupcake every single Monday. And so our, our not as nice friend um, <laughs> stops giving us a cupcake. And how our dopamine responds since it was expecting and anticipating and as that anticipatory feeling of that reward is that the anticipation actually heightens the system and that when it's not received or when that food isn't received, it actually drops down and has our neuron responses to be lowered and gives a a withdrawal or, or even a depression in that linear model. So what we find out is that dopamine is actually kind of a learning signal. Um, and that unexpectancy or helps to relearn or reteach that response system. So every single minute, and this gives us kind of hope and insight that every single minute that we have a change in um, our response or a change in some, or help change response in someone else, a different circuit occurs. And every repeat of a new behavior changes into a stronger circuit. So in a heightened reward system that we see with clients with food addiction or binge eating disorder, or eating addiction, there's a bombardment of thoughts and feelings that feel intrusive and that every new action kind of lessens those thoughts or lessens the intensity of those thoughts and feelings. Now, what's interesting is that there are many things that increase the reward system. And so how do we tell if something is just increasing that reward system or that it really, really bleeds over, bleeds into a more of an addictive type behavior? And there are some key constructs with that diagnostic of changing that certain action of a rewarding stimuli into an addictive action. So trying to control the behavior, craving, tolerance, withdrawal, emotional distress. And what do we do with all of these things? Or how do we make sense of all of these things? Now, with our neural wiring, what we want is we really want that kind of normal brain function. And I like to put it like the game hot and cold. So when you're trying to get to a finish line, if you look at my picture here on the left-hand side, we have our normal brain function that when we're trying to get from start to finish, right? If we were playing the game kind of hot and cold, as you're going towards the finish line, it would say hotter. And as you're going away from that ultimate goal, it would say colder. And you would change based upon those messages. Now with someone with binge eating disorder, um, just because they did test this more with binge eating disorder than they have with food addiction um, and using that, that, let's say, moniker, is that um, the signaling and the um, indication of if someone is getting hot or getting cold or, or getting towards their goal is, is heightened and also doesn't let someone know that there's an inhibition or if they're heading towards the correct spot or going away from it. So in my example here on the right, that may help us put it into context. It's when someone's heading towards that goal or that finish, it is in an overwhelming bombardment of 
yes, oh my goodness, keep going. And it feels great in the moment. It's almost like a standing ovation. And when they're heading away from that goal, there's radio silence. There's not that inhibitory signal to say like, hey, slow down, or hey, you're not really going in the right direction. And so even when they, even when someone in this kind of symptom uh, finishes or gets towards that goal, there's no, there's confusing pathways of, did I finish? Did I stop? And it's a bit confusing of how their brain functions within this. And I like to explain this a bit to my, my clients because I think it helps to understand what we're trying to do with food and how we're trying to change. So it equals into something a little bit um, more tangible. Um, and that's sometimes not just necessarily that they're just wrong or something's wrong with them and that there's other neural pathways that are affecting how they work with food. And of course, within this food can be that with looking at the neural rewiring, if we have the intention that something is bad and that reward is anticipated, then the neural wiring won't change. You still have the assumption and the anticipation of that food. And so it should be looked at rewiring a constellation of related syndromes that really, really help um, to control consumption and ultimately that failure to control consumption. So going forward, you know, food can be used as that drug of choice. Um, I do enjoy this quote by Oprah of just looking at it as, as that it could be utilized not only as the neural pathways and, and looking at how it affects the brain, but just how it actually can bleed into the other aspects of life. So, and knowing that it affects the brain and knowing that um, there's several aspects that this um, food addiction can bleed into how our clients utilize food and how they can essentially feel like it hijacks their reward functions. What, what can we do? What are some practical clinical applications that we can do to help reduce food addiction and help to move steps forward into creating new neural pathways and new relationships with foods? So we know that lifestyle modifications are the cornerstone for body weight management, but um, there's also that really, really strong curve. And so that baseline, um, there's some baseline applications that should be followed to just improve motivation, improve if there's cognitive behavioral therapy or skill building that's involved in utilizing other coping mechanisms and utilizing other, um, other skills to work and be utilized with food. And so one, um, people shouldn't starve. And so scientists actually believe or have taken a dive into looking at hunger and that stimulation for craving and uncontrolled food intake. And so by avoiding these signals that trigger the increased desire for food and paying attention to signals of food, hunger, and satiety is essential. And so discovering when someone is hungry and eating when hungry, it, it seems a little bit weird or a little bit off maybe if we're trying to work within weight management. However, mainly tapping into those hunger and those fullness signals will help someone to be able to recognize, am I really hungry because I'm hungry? Or am I really, or am I just hungry or wanting a desire of food because of stress or emotions? 
And so that brings us to the next, the resilience with stress and emotions. And so some people under stress eat more, some people under stress eat less, but there is that emotion and that stress um, connection. And so working into finding healthier or different strategy, strategies for tolerating feelings of sadness, anxiety, anger, depression helps with this baseline of that motivation, along with some sleep and regular exercise as well. And some of the things that, that we always say already within um, helping someone control their weight or moving their weight in a different way. Let's talk about traits a little bit. So we do know that brain imaging studies shows differences in parts of the brain involved in eating and with individuals in disordered eating. But there's also that there's certain traits um, that have existed before the disorder and that may help to maintain that disordered relationship. And I want to give some examples here. Um, just, just to bring this home a little bit. So, um, let's say for example, perfectionism with someone who has the trait of perfection, perfectionism that may really, really help, let's say in their work possibly, but in looking at the, their disordered eating or their food addiction, it might show that perfectionism can help to maintain that disordered relationship. So for example, um, they create or you help them create a dietary instruction and they have to follow that dietary instruction to a T or if not, then it's all over and they might as well just give up or stop because they didn't do it perfect. And so and looking at these traits, there's some way to actually utilize your traits or have someone utilize their traits into a positive effect of changing this behavior. So looking at your traits, you can think of it like this. Um, there's tools within this trait that can be practiced to acquire skills, or it can be used to be destructive. And I think of hammering a nail. And so we can actually utilize that hammer and nail and practice over time to be able to hit that nail right on the head and make a cute little birdhouse over here. Or we can utilize that kind of tool and attempt and keep trying to hit that nail on the head. But a, essentially creating just holes in the wall and not really, really utilizing that trait or that skill in a really constructive way. So let's look at how we can take those traits and utilize them in a treatment strategy. And with working with clients with food addiction or eating disorders or eating addiction, I'm gonna use all the, all the terms together. Sometimes taking that trait or taking what seems to be their, their difficulty and being able to adopt a consistent dietary intervention and really looking at it as a strength and constructing a strategy around that. So we do have, I, I put the top six that have been studied to take a look um, within the disordered eating world of traits that tend to make that disordered eating or, or maintain that disordered relationship. And certainty and tolerance of sensitivity to reward and punishment, obsessionality, anxiety, inhibition, perfectionism. And I took my perfectionism example as before, but let's kind of maybe utilize that again and take that trait as a strength. So they're, someone is achievement oriented or they're striving for excellence per se. And so a strategy to work with that particular type of client 
would be to setting short-term goals, um, including some other non-focused or non-weight focused goals and allowing for flexibility or allowing for a backup plan. You know, there's that only one way or, you know, if that one way doesn't happen, then we stop. Then we, that, that just messes everything up. And so allowing for that flexibility and giving some structure around that flexibility. So if this doesn't happen, then this is plan B and this is plan B, C. So that way that, that perfectionism trait can still be utilized, but also at the same time, um, allowing for that flexibility and really, really utilizing that, that trait as a strength. Um, and so some of your different nutritional products, for example, that HealthWise um, has, it could be that, hey, we want you to have this um, certain meal plan. And if not, if, if you're out and about and it's difficult to get that certain meal in, maybe then our plan B is going to have a nutritional product, a HealthWise product, um, potentially. And so we utilize some of those different goals and flexibilities to be able to have a treatment strategy that works with someone's natural treat and doesn't just appear or try to go against what they're really used to. So other nutritional interventions actually that can help with food addiction um, is really to take a look at what to add, what to add to potentially increase dopamine naturally. So there's not that um, reward functionality that's coming with a hyper palatable food. And so that there's not just a don't eat this, there's a, hey, have this instead, or have this that will also increase that reward center instead. So some of that is in increasing fiber um, that doesn't necessarily, let's say, increase the reward system, but helps create that bulk um, and maintains that um, feeling of fullness and feeling of stillness in someone. Um, low in sugar and no artificial sugar. That's one that um, for some people, they do have to temporarily go away from sugar um, just to kind of really give that good break. But um, the artificial sugar tends to um, have a little bit, especially in those hyper, hyper palatable foods. Um, it tends to have that really, really big increase. Um, your omega-3 fatty acids, such as mackerel, salmon, herring, oysters, flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, um, help reduce um, inflammation, but also at the same time, too, can create a really good baseline. Foods rich in tyrosine actually help do help to um, increase or release dopamine. So some of those actually um, it are almonds, some of those foods, I should say, uh, almonds, bananas, avocado, beef, eggs, bean, fish, chicken, watermelon, and yogurt. An increase in our kind of happiness chemical called pregnenolone. It's a mouthful. Um, and so it is the building block of our body's hormones. And it also helps to lift someone's mood naturally. And so with those foods, that includes eggs and dairy, actually. Resveratrol, that increase also helps to naturally increase dopamine. Those would be blueberries, cranberries, grapes, peanuts, pistachios. Adding in some DHA naturally through some of our um, seafood or taking a DHA and really focusing on monounsaturated fats such as avocado, canola oil, nuts, or olive oil. Those are some natural nutritional interventions that can help. And then we, of course, have some lifestyle interventions that can just help to really increase mood and help to make someone more in tune and more in tune with those personal signals, such as movement, sleep, 
meditation, music, etc. And I think the important thing with kind of reframing and reframing these connections or these really strong connections with food addiction is utilizing it as medicine. So oftentimes instead of increasing that anticipation and saying, okay, don't eat a cupcake. Um, and, and then someone really desiring that cupcake, my approach will be, okay, I want to have you take this food and I want to have you add on, or I want to have you utilize food as medicine. And here's your prescription. For example, I want you to have protein in the morning. I want you to have this much um, vegetables at lunch or this much uh, protein at lunch and really taking a look at it as a, as a dose um, of something that's going to help them instead of establishing that reward system with food. Um, taking a look at like real versus processed food and um, just reframing of what's, what nutrients within those, um, kind of with our nutri nutritional interventions that are going to help. Um, looking at body healing versus body harming. So um, sometimes just reframing that as we're going to help heal and heal, establish those new neural pathways with healing the body. Um, and this is how we're going to do it, is helpful to reframe that. As I said, look at adding those foods and not subtracting, at least at, at the start, um, to help establish um, that maybe last supper type feeling and really utilizing sometimes people look at food and look at their body um, and kind of have a disconnect as far as their brain versus their body. And so sometimes utilizing food for that brain functionality and, and just reframing this um, into a strategy for overcoming food addiction and eventually working, even avoiding those hyper palatable foods and maybe even doing that at the beginning or for a period of time just to create that disconnect, um, but also not create that heightened, heightened reward um, or that never ever feeling within there. So I hope that some of these reframings and some of these interventions and looking at traits help to help you at least with your practitioners and with your clientele to build that connection have a better understanding about the brain and a better understanding about how that functionality can work within food and what are some practical things that you can do to just help your patient population within this? As I'm wrapping up, I want to make sure that I have time for questions. I also want to thank HealthWise too as well for sponsoring this and wanted to make sure that I let you know about our upcoming um, future webinars where we're going to take a look at ketogenic protein sparing modified fasting versus kind of a ketogenic diet program and what the difference is between those um, terminologies and dietetic um, influences. And then also looking at obesity as a disease. So coming up in June and coming up in September um, at noon Eastern time will be those, those two different webinars, which I'm happy to host and be a part of. 